what is this non-cooperation about which you have heard much and why do we want to offer this non-cooperation? I wish to go for the time being into the way. There are two things about this country. The first and the foremost is the Khilafat question. On this, the heart of the Muslims of India has become lacerated. British pledges given after the greatest deliberation by the Prime Minister of England in the name of the English nation have been dragged into the mire. The promises given to the Muslim in India on the strength of which the consideration that was expected by the British nation was exacted have been broken and the great religion of Islam has been placed in danger. The Muslims hold and I venture to think they rightly hold that so long as British promises remain unfulfilled, so long it is impossible for them to tender wholehearted fealty and loyalty to the British connection. And if it is to be a choice for a devout Muslim between royalty to the British connection and loyalty to the code and prophet, he will not require a second to make his choice. And he has declared his choice. The Muslims say frankly, openly and honorably to the whole world that if the British ministers and the British nation do not fulfill the pledges given to them and do not wish to regard with respect the sentiments of the 70 millions of the inhabitants of India who profess the faith of Islam, it will be impossible for them to retain Islamic loyalty. It is a question then for the rest of the Indian population to consider whether they want to perform a neighborly duty by their Muslim countrymen. And if they do so, they have an opportunity of a lifetime, which will not occur for another hundred years, to show their goodwill, fellowship and friendship, and to prove what they have been saying for all these years, that the Muslim is the brother of the Hindu. If the Hindu regards that before the connection with the British nation comes his natural connection with his Muslim brother, then I say to you that if you find that the Muslim claim is just, that it is based upon real sentiment, and that its background is this great religious feeling, you cannot do otherwise than help the Muslim through and through, so long as their cause remains just, and that the means for attaining the end remains equally just, honorable, and free from harm to India. These are the plain conditions which the Indian Muslims have accepted. And it was when they saw that they could accept the preferred act of the Hindus, that they could always justify the cause, and that the means before the whole world, that they decided to accept the proffered hand of fellowship. It is then for the Hindus and Muslims to offer a united front to the whole of the Christian powers of Europe and tell them that weak as India is, India has still got the capacity of preserving her self-respect. She still knows how to die for her religion and self-respect. That is the Khilafat in a nutshell. But you have also got the Punjab. The Punjab has wounded the heart of India as no other question has for the past century. 
I do not exclude from my calculation the mutiny of 1857. Whatever hardships India had to suffer during the mutiny, the insult that was attempted to be offered to her during the passes of the Rowlett legislation, and that which was offered after its passage were unparalleled in Indian history. It is because you want justice from the British nation. In connection with the Punjab atrocities, you have to devise ways and means as to how you can get this justice. The House of Commons, the House of Lords, Mr. Montek, the Viceroy of India, every one of them know what the feeling of India is on this Khilafat question. And on that of the Punjab, the debates in both the Houses of Parliament, the action of Mr. Montag and that of the Viceroy have demonstrated to you completely that they were not willing to give the justice which is India's due and which she demands. I suggest that our leaders have got to find a way out of this great difficulty. And unless we have made ourselves, even with the British rulers in India, and unless we have gained a measure of self-respect at the hands of the British rulers in India, no connection and no friendly intercourse is possible between them and ourselves. I therefore venture to suggest this beautiful and unanswerable method of non-cooperation. I have been told that non-cooperation is unconstitutional. On the contrary, I hold that non-cooperation is a just and religious doctrine. It is the inherent right of every individual and it is perfectly constitutional. A great lover of the British Empire has said that under the British Constitution, even a successful rebellion is perfectly constitutional, and he quotes historical instances, which I cannot deny, in support of his claim. I do not claim any constitutionality for a rebellion successful or otherwise, so long as that rebellion means in the ordinary sense of the term. What it does mean, namely, arresting justice by violent means. On the contrary, I have said it repeatedly to my countrymen that violence, whatever end it may serve in Europe, will never serve us in India. My brother and friend, Shaukat Ali, believes in methods of violence, and if it was in his power to draw the sword against the British Empire. I know that he has got the courage of a man, and he has got also the wisdom to see that he should offer the battle of the British Empire. But because he recognizes as a true soldier that means of violence are not open to India, he sides with me accepting my humble assistance and pledges his word that so long as I am with him and so long as he believes in the doctrine, so long will he not harbor even the idea of violence against any single Englishman or any single man on earth. I am here to bear witness that he has been following out this plan of non-violent, non-cooperation to the very letter, and I am asking India to follow this non-violent, non-cooperation. I tell you that there is not a better soldier living in our ranks in British India than Shaukat Ali. When the time for the drawing of the sword comes, if it ever comes, you will find him drawing that sword and you will find me retiring to the jungles of Hindustan. As soon as India accepts the doctrine of the sword, 
my life as an Indian is finished. It is because I believe in a mission special to India and it is because I believe that the ancients of India after centuries of experience have found out that the true thing for any human being on earth is not justice based on violence but justice based on sacrifice of self justice based on yakna and kurbani i cling to that doctrine and i shall cling to it forever it is for that reason i tell you that whilst my friend believes also in the doctrine of violence and has adopted the doctrine of non-violence as a weapon of the weak i believe in the doctrine of non-violence as a weapon of the strongest i believe that man is the strongest soldier for daring to die unarmed with his best bear before the enemy so much for the non-violent part of non-cooperation i therefore venture to suggest to my learned countrymen that so long as the doctrine of non-cooperation remains non-violent so long there is nothing unconstitutional in that doctrine i ask further it is unconstitutional for me to say to the british government i refuse to serve you is it constitutional for our worthy chairman to return with every respect all the titles that he has ever held from the government it is unconstitutional for any parent to withdraw his children from a government or edit school is it unconstitutional for a lawyer to say i shall no longer support the arm of the law so long as that arm of law is used not to raise me but to debase me is it unconstitutional for a civil servant or for a judge to say i refuse to serve a government which traduces his own countrymen is it unconstitutional for me to go to the christian to the agriculturist and say to him it is not wise for you to pay any taxes if these taxes are used by the government not to raise you but to weaken you i hold and i venture to submit there is nothing unconstitutional in it what is more i have done every one of these things in my life and nobody has questioned the constitutional character of it i was in kaira walking in the midst of 7 lakhs of agriculturist they had all suspended the payment of taxes and the whole of india was at one with me nobody considered that it was unconstitutional i submit that in the whole plan of non-cooperation there is nothing unconstitutional in the midst of this unconstitutional government in the midst of a nation which has built up this magnificent constitution for the people of india to become weak and to crawl on their belly it will be highly unconstitutional for the people of india to pocket every insult that is offered to them it is highly unconstitutional for the 70 millions of muhammadans of india to submit to a violent wrong done to their religion it is highly unconstitutional for the whole of india to sit still and cooperate with an unjust government which has trodden under its feet the honor of the punjab i say to my countrymen so long as you have a sense of honor and so long as you wish to remain the descendants and the defenders of the noble traditions that have been handed to you for generation after generation it is unconstitutional for you not to non cooperate and unconstitutional for you to cooperate with a government which has become so unjust as our government has become i am not anti english i am not anti british 
I am not anti any government, but I am anti untruth, anti humbug, and anti injustice. So long as the government spells injustice, it may regard me as its enemy, implacable enemy. I had hoped at the Congress at Amritsar. I am speaking God's truth before you, when I pleaded on bended knees before some of you for cooperation with the government. I had full hope that the British ministers, who are wise as a rule, would placate the Muslim sentiment that they would do full justice in the matter of the Punjab atrocities, and therefore. I said, let us return goodwill to the hand of fellowship that has been extended to us, which I then believed was extended to us through the royal proclamation. It was on that account that I pleaded for cooperation. But today, that fate, having gone and obliterated by the acts of the British ministers, I am here to plead, not for futile obstruction in the Legislative Council, but for real substantial non-cooperation, which would paralyze the mightiest government on earth. That is what I stand for today. Until we have wrung justice, and until we have wrung our self-respect from unwilling hands and from unwilling pens, there can be no cooperation. Our Shastras say, and I say so, with the greatest deference to all the greatest religious preceptors of India, but without fear of contradiction, that our Shastras teach us that there shall be no cooperation between injustice and justice, between an unjust man and a justice loving man, between truth and untruth. Cooperation is a duty only so long as government protects your honor, and non-cooperation is an equal duty when the government, instead of protecting, robs you of your honor. That is the doctrine of non-cooperation. Delivered in Madras on August 12, 1920.